Welcome to another episode of the Volkswagen Art for All Online Edition. I am Sven Beckstätte, curator at Hamburger Bahnhof Museum for Gegenwart Berlin. In the October issue, we continue to talk about art and music. This time, our guest is Stan Douglas. His work, Dirty V's Breeze and Mime, can be seen at the moment in the exhibition Magical Soup Media Art from the Nationalgalerie Collection, the Friedrich Christian Flick Collection at Hamburger Bahnhof, and Loans. Apart from that, there are several works by Stan Douglas in the collection of the Nationalgalerie, like Der Sandmann, that were donated by Friedrich Christian Flick. Stan Douglas was born in 1960 in Vancouver, where he also lives today. He participated three times in Documenta and was selected to represent Canada at the Venice Biennial in 2022. From early on, music played a key role in his video installations. Today, we are very happy to have a telephone conversation with Stan in Vancouver. Welcome, Stan. I read that uh, before you studied art, you worked as a DJ in a club in Vancouver. Did DJing have an influence on your artistic practice? For about two years, I was working as a, a DJ professionally. Every Friday, I was playing at a club uh, in Vancouver. And um, just kind of happened, there was a club was kind of like quiet on, on weekends or Their tea dance on Saturday was, was a big thing, but not much was happening on Fridays. I kind of pitched them idea because I worked at the coffee, coffee bar next door. I said, if I played records, my friends would come. We did that, and it actually was quite successful for a while. But during that process, I learned more and more about what it is to work with a DJ, how you kind of create an environment, uh, create an event using music, and using existing cultural material to make new uh, cultural events, which is kind of key for my, my artistic practice. Um, although I kind of ended because my musical interest began to grow and I uh, was kind of tired of spending all my money on dance records. Um, so um, I, I eventually quit after a couple of years and I, and I tried to work at a larger club and um, they wanted to tell me what to play. I didn't like that. So I just kind of uh, backed off from that. But around this time was just after I, I graduated from art school and um, uh, the school I went to was kind of antagonistic towards language. And so I made a point of reading some long novels to uh, get my uh, get, get my, my chops on, on, on literature and that kind of thing. And one of those novels was um, Dr. Faustus by uh, Thomas Mann. And um, mm. toward the end, I believe, there's a very amazing description of Beethoven's Opus 111, um, uh, which made me have to go and find that, uh, that, that piece of music. I wasn't really that versed with classical music, but there is an episode in uh, the second movement where – it sounds almost exactly like ragtime. And I made one of my first musical pieces based on, based on that. I found a company who could cut uh, player piano rolls, so I had them cut that episode, um, as well as sort of framing episodes around it, onto a player piano roll to make this uh, ragtime-sounding music sound even more like ragtime. This first piece from 1986 was called uh, Onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia, of course, is uh, a word which sounds like the thing it represents, and of course, The fact that we hear ragtime in Beethoven means that we can't hear the music that Beethoven heard. So I was kind of interested in that, in that, that condition. that a friend of Adorno was the musical advisor to Thomas Mann on that, uh, that novel, um, I began to sort of look up his work. And 
his brain on music was kind of illuminating to me because I understood music not the way he describes it, which is in the way in which the musical form um, uh, has, a, has a condensation of the cultural ideas of the time in which it was made, which I never really thought about before. Um, now, Jordan himself is famously antagonistic towards jazz, but I think there's a couple reasons why that is. Uh, first of all, he ne probably never really heard proper jazz. He only mentions uh, one person by name, and that's Benny Goodman, um, which is not what I would consider to be you know, proper jazz. Um, it somehow uh, represents the commodity form in, in its form by advertising itself in the music. But in jazz music, I think a key thing is that it is being made by people who themselves were commodities um, in, until the 19th century, uh, African-Americans. And the very thing which um, uh, the Dorno valorizes in Beethoven is uh, piano music. Opus 111 has a very kind of sentimental theme, uh, which is then kind of redeemed by the variations, um, just as, say, the Diabelli variations is based on a, uh, he says somewhere, I can't remember where, but it says, says somewhere that the, uh, uh, this sort of terrible waltz by Diabelli is redeemed by Beethoven's variations. The same thing happens in jazz when a 10 pan alley song is taken and then elaborated upon uh, later on. It was in Dirty V's Breeze and Mine from 1982-83 that you brought together the white European classical tradition and the black tradition of jazz and blues. Um, uh, it's, in, a, in a way, the, the Dirty V's is really more about, the, or my interest was more about the lyrics uh, than about the music itself, although the music itself kind of represents a more general cultural condition that uh, is being, being addressed somehow. Um, in, in, uh, in Breath, there are these subtitles translating the French lyrics from this art song by Charles Gounod, um, in which the singer is talking about his object of desire as being kind of a, a rebel. So it's in a way projecting upon the other their, yeah. uh, their desire and sort of trying to determine what the other should be or how the other, other should think. In part two, mine, you have um, almost like uh, my lips in a, in a series of uh, different uh, configurations, occasionally appearing to animate in, in lip sync with a Robert Johnson song called Preach and Blues, in which um, the singer is talking about seeing all of their um, all of their blues, all of their their, their fears, all, all of their um, nightmares sort of manifest as a person. So it's seeing oneself outside of oneself. <laughs> Consciousness, the idea that uh, um, from W. B. Du Bois, where uh, uh, Du Bois, they, they call it in the States, where um, African Americans understand themselves as themselves or understand themselves as the other, as they're being looked on by, uh, by by a white gaze. And so this this work kind of plays with these ideas, almost through the idea of uh, language and speech, language uh, belonging to the European language being presented in the, in breath, and then speech in which is always a kind of an act of uh, ventriloquism. Um, that we see in, in mime, where you uh, speak words which are not your own in order to represent yourself. Um, and that's kind of the ultimate paradox of language, where how can you, um, how do you build your own identity through, through things which are not, not, your, not your own? Another work, Pursuit Fear Catastrophe, Ruskin, B.C., from 1993, 
is based on a composition by Arnold Schoenberg. Yeah, so uh, Pursuit of Catastrophe is, is based on, I guess, a challenge that I, I felt I got from uh, Arnold Schoenberg, where he says he made that piece of music, accompanying it to a cinematographic scene, uh, a musical accompaniment to, to a film that could not be made. So, of course, I had to make, go and make that film, um, almost as a, uh, as, as a, as a challenge. really is sort of a historical coincidence that at the same time he was writing that, composing that music, um, there is a community of dairy for Japanese dairy farmers established in this place called Ruskin, B.C., the site of a previous utopian uh, community on that location. People followers of John Ruskin established this, this sort of, um, uh, quote-unquote, socialist um, community, commune out there. Um, and the Japanese dairy farmers um, – couldn't have certain kinds of work in Vancouver because uh, of sort of basis laws. Um, and they were able to sort of find autonomy in this place. But of course the war happened and uh, they were declared uh, um, enemy aliens and taken to uh, concentration camps in the interior of BC. So that was kind of a, a catastrophe that befell them much like that of the uh, Jewish composers like, like uh, Schoenberg. So there's parallels, but it's all kind of, uh, all kind of fuzzy in some way. And just kind of, it kind of felt right, but I couldn't really make a, a very, um, sort of logical argument for why I put these two things together. Um, but I sort of took this form of music from the period, um, the 1920s, I guess, when you still had play pianos or uh, silent films and piano accompaniment, and I made a silent film to go along with um, uh, the Schoenberg piece, which um, is kind of, in, it begins silent, and the music starts when a lie is told, and uh, it gets up to a sort of a, a climax, and then once the, the lie is um, uncovered, and uh, made right, the music stops. So the, the music is all about this condition of uh, uh, a person uh, being accused of a crime, a Japanese man being accused of a crime, and once he's sort of uh, released from that problem, um, everything um, goes silent again. Um, yeah, so it's, a, I guess, a 15-minute, 16-mil film, some, some film that goes with a fancy disc clavier um, uh, Yamaha piano, computer MIDI-controlled piano. Your video installation, Orchon, from 1992, refers to free jazz and its reception in Europe. For this video installation, you worked together with George Lewis. I was in Paris trying to understand what I was going to do. I actually had gone there at the invitation of uh, Christine Van Asch, a curator at the Poverty Center, mm -hmm. who knew they had a TV studio that no one ever used. So he, she invited video artists to go and, and make videos there. And I began mm -hmm. to get more involved in looking at um, what was happening uh, in the French cultural scene. And I became kind of fascinated by a guy named Jean-Christophe Avete, who was a producer responsible for a lot of these um, jazz programs uh, on TV. Um, first uh, live broadcast from clubs in uh, saint germain de Prey, uh, but later these studio um, uh, productions, which I kind of mimicked in our shop, where it's often very abstract, often very, uh, you know, stark black and white uh, with um, flats sort of making, making contrast. And then often involving uh, close-ups of musicians' hands, but not really recording the ensemble interaction that makes that uh, makes makes jazz what jazz is. Um, mm -hmm. As I was researching, I, I went to a place called Ina, which was the uh, Audiovisual Foundation in France, and I um, it was very kind of Kafkaesque, these weird circular hallways and these uh, shopping carts filled with um, open reel quarter-inch uh, audio tape, and I requested a few different recordings to listen to. And one of them was the first concert of Albert Eiler in Paris. And um, it's kind of amazing where, you know, it, it broke a number of times, but um, this is where I heard, uh, for the first time, Spirits of Joyce, which I wasn't that familiar, I was not that familiar with his work. And mm -hmm. so once after it broke numerous times, so I re-spliced it, listened to it, 
um, wiped the tears from my eyes and then called the curator um, of the of the archive and they took the tapes, put them in a shopping cart, and probably no one has ever heard those recordings again. Um, but this, what I heard in that music was, uh, um, even though I was kind of known as being a, a kind of wild performer, I realized there's a very subtle uh, music musicology going on in that work, where he was basically uh, deconstructing the French national anthem, the Marseillaise, which is sort of famously racist, but trying to find a place for himself in that context by interposing it with um, motifs from American music, uh, a gospel melody, gospel melody, sorry, a gospel melody, uh, a call and response, and, uh, and, and a fanfare. So all these kind of like meld together in that music, which is quite kind of extraordinary. And so, you know, I've been interviewing people in Paris. Um, Sonny Murray, who is a, a bass player for uh, uh, Eiler, um, uh, Alvin's Elvis Silva, who played with Eiler as well, and Sonny Rala, um, Steve Potts, and a few other people, and um, Stephen Lacey. Um, wow. And well, I sort of I became in contact with George Lewis, who was the musical director for the piece. And I kind of said, you know, I met these people in Paris, and maybe we can make an ensemble out of this. He goes, and George says, those people will kill each other. <laughs> you don't want them to play together. So um, he said, let me put, put it together. And he found a, a more simpatico group of, uh, of players to, to, to play the piece, which is what you see in our shop. <laughs> How would you describe your relationship to um, George Lewis? Because he later on also wrote a theoretical text about your work, and yeah. especially on Suspiria, which is a it's a it's a great great essay actually. Oh yeah, no, no, George and I are good, are good friends. Uh, we're in contact when we can be. When I uh, get to New York, he does come to Vancouver now and then. Um, but I've, I've learned a lot from that relationship, and perhaps. He made me more aware of computer music, which probably led to what I did later on with uh, the recombinant um, narrative pieces, because in, in a way that, I mean, both that plus a knowledge of like uh, uh, surrealism, um, which I kind of picked up uh, earlier on, uh, led to this sort of organize, organization of time, narrative time in the recombinant mm -hmm. pieces that you, you see in those, in those later works. Um, but the key thing in, in Orchamp was the, having a relationship between the, the cameras and the music. They have like uh, be able to uh, improvise with the cameras to see what's going on, uh, to record that, um, even though it's not the focus of the focus of attention because at, at certain episodes of the music, a camera has to sort of one camera has to be on a uh, sort of formalized predetermined shot. Uh, where the other camera is free to sort of uh, search around to see what the players are doing. At another point mm -hmm. in music, the that camera has to be uh, on this for my shot and the, the the edit happens and that the previous camera is now free to, to look around. So It took a lot of um, choreography, and the the sort of staff uh, hired one DOP uh, for the piece, but the staff camera operator was very very lazy, and when he was not um, uh, not shooting his shot, he just let the camera drop, and this was like pointing at the floor. Eventually, I had to sort of take him off and, and did the operating myself, uh, hmm. which is kind of accounts for some uncomfortable framing now and then. But um, that was my first experience uh, of, as a camera operator under duress. <laughs>
and in many ways, this piece was kind of an allegory of African Americans' um, sort of self-exile uh, in Europe, uh, finding a different way of life for many musicians that they couldn't have if they were living in, in the United States. In Pursuit Fear Catastrophe, Ruskin BC, you already referred to a moment of an utopian possibility in history, which is also a key motive of Orchon and later on in Luanda Kinshasa. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are concerts of, organized by the Communist Party with the uh, uh, Ensemble of Chicago in Paris, with, with thousands of people who attended, because there was thought that uh, this was kind of a, um, a model for utopian social organization. Um, and, you know, I, I took up that same idea in, in London and Shasta, where looking at this, I mean, this, this record on the corner, which I sort of was inspired that, with that work, was always kind of what utopia sounded like to me. And so the record is only... 45 minutes long, so I decided to, to make more uh, for, for selfish reasons, so I could hear more, uh, but also to have this image of um, um, people working, uh, performing in collaboration in a way that uh, permitted everybody to have a certain kind of freedom, um, which is kind of a key idea in that piece. Yeah, it's somehow like uh, akin to speculative fiction, where um, uh, something that could have happened, which didn't happen, um, Miles Davis Uh, it was always interested in anything popular, and so he thought with this record on the corner, somehow he mixed, uh, um, you know, uh, jazz, jazz funk with um, Indian classical music. He would be a big hit with the kids. Of course, it was his worst-selling record of all time, um, even though well regarded by many people. But I, I thought at exactly this time he was making that record, Manu de Bango's uh, Sol Mocoso was a huge hit in the disco underground. So what if Miles had picked up on that and sort of tried to make a Uh, a combination of what he was doing was on the corner uh, with, with Afrobeat, and so that's what we try to achieve in uh, Luanda Kinshasa. Of which there are many variations. Uh, first one is called Luanda, which has got the Afrobeat feel. And it's Kinshasa, which has got more of a uh, more of a rock feel. And hoping to sort of place the time based on the fact that um, Miles often named uh, songs after uh, liberation struggles in Africa. And of course, um, in uh, you know in, in the, in the mid 70s, um, Angola was became was liberated from Portuguese colonialism. Uh, it's getting a, a civil war for 22 years. But also there's the rumble um, in the jungle, rumble in the jungle, and the music concert in Kinshasa as well. So that kind of connects to, the, to the, this period um, in, in hopefully a, a clear way. And what happens is we have two cameras, which are kind of well, one camera, and shot in over two days. One day we shoot all the rhythm instruments. Next day we shoot all the, the lead instruments uh, on opposite sides of the studio. And then these are montaged together to make uh, make new music. They never actually played together at the same time. It was all construction of the studio, which somehow mimics what Miles was doing with his producer, Tia Macero, uh, in that period, where they basically have these long jams in the studio, and then Tia and Miles would go with the, 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 um, uh, uh, the, the splicing block and, and re reassemble and build the music, finish composing music um, in the studio. So this happens mm -hmm. um, in a more complex way in a lot of because I had both 
uh, at the music and the visuals. So you couldn't have somebody not playing what you're hearing, otherwise it wouldn't make it, make any sense. So that was the most challenging aspect of uh, finishing the work. And the first, I guess the first four or five songs I was able to do by myself, learning how to sort of cull extraneous music to sort of, sort of tease out an idea of a song in certain episodes, but my producer, Scott Harding, uh, had to come in for the last um, five or six because um, my, my first attempts just didn't make any musical sense. He goes, oh my God, those are different keys. You can't, can't do that. So he gave me some, some more guidance on how to, how to make that happen. Um, but the main conceit is to sort of making making fun of uh, the Rolling Stones and their, 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 um, their show, uh, the Godard movie, uh, One Plus One, or Simply for the Devil, in which they're spending days and days trying to figure out how to compose that song. Um, but And then when the colors come in, funny, it gels. But uh, this is more like a geyser of music where they're sort of, sort of spewing out um, uh, sort of new, new music constantly, without, almost virtually without end. Next to Scott Hardin, you also collaborated with Jason Moran, who can be seen playing piano. Basically, it, was, it kind of it seems kind of faded somehow. Like it was, uh, um, I was planning to go see Jason's band with Scott and um, at Birdland, I think it was. Um, and then I, I kept him. I mean, and then I did a talk at Columbia, and Jason was there and said, um, uh, "Have you ever thought of doing anything live?" And I said, "Well, I had this idea for doing the opera Lulu, but that didn't work out very well." And then he came to me later and said, that's amazing because I've been studying that score for uh, for the past year. And then later on, I kept on bumping into Jason in um, uh, in, in Soho. So, oh, sorry, in, in Chelsea. So it seemed kind of mm -hmm. faded that we would work together. And when I thought about doing one of the I just thought of him being connected to that, to that scene would be a, a good uh, musical director for the piece. And so I kind of laid out the instruments I wanted. And then he showed me uh, the YouTube clips of people when we – built the band based on uh, based on that, his connections. Yeah, later on, I was showing it in, in London, uh, associated with the, the Vital Factory, and um, they said, let's, let's make a record. And so I, I thought, great. And I told uh, Jason, he says, uh, that's great, but um, you know, the contract with the musicians was only for that, that video, not for recording. That's what they make their living. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to get paid again. <laughs> so we, 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 we did the right thing, and everybody's happy. Your most complex piece of recombinant narrative is Suspiria from 2003 that you showed at Documenta and in which you refer to a film by Dario Argento with a soundtrack by Italian proc rock band Goblin. Um, but this uh, sort of culminated in uh, Suspiria, uh, which is somehow uh, takes this arbitrage idea to sort of new heights where we have uh, 250, wait, 256 different narrative elements, um, seven songs of which there are as many as 35 components or stems, uh, which we combine it in various ways to make um, make songs and make, tell stories that would never repeat itself until after the moment that the sun burns out. So this is basically this huge uh, time scale which this thing works. And it's not, not it's kind of impossible for any two people to see the same work if it uh, rolls over time. And it's, it's, um, it's based on the Grimm's fairy tales, are taking all the stories about economics in the Grimm's Fairy Tales and all the stories about witchcraft and um, uh, the supernatural in, in the, a volume one of Capital by Marx and put, puts those together, these those together in, uh, in this piece. And because it's um, a generative system, it gets stranger and stranger over time. And I remember going back to Stuttgart when I had that retrospective in 2007 and visiting Suspiria again and seeing um, stories I'd never imagined before, very kind of bizarre combinations of stories, which are quite, quite incredible. Um, but yeah, this is basically uh, based on the, the, the film Suspiria, the music is based on the film Suspiria, and the look, the very saturated colors uh, of Dario Argento, a horror film where uh, a young woman from the North America goes to sort of study European culture at a dance academy, which turns out to be a witch's coven. And for me, that was kind of an um, allegory of my coming to Documenta uh, to perform <laughs> in, in uh, <laughs> In, in, uh, uh, where, where this piece was, piece was first shown. I would gladly trade you your cloth for this.
I bet you've got at least 50. I'll bet you this is against half. Yeah, it was uh, kind of extraordinary. We had uh, in documented with the live version. We had cameras in this um, the Hercules Monument uh, up on the hill, which kind of uh, surveys the entire city, which you can't uh, escape. It's always kind of looking at you. This uh, huge statue of Hercules. So all the cameras were inside that that building, and we broadcast um, the re recombined stories, combining surveillance cameras and pre-recorded materials that in the studio in Vancouver going both to the ex 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 exhibition hall in, in Castle and then broadcast on TV at night, uh, which was, you know, I thought it, if I could get it to run for a day, I'd be happy, but it ran for um, at least a month, um, mm -hmm. and it was just kind of incredible, until uh, people realized it was live and began uh, putting uh, spray painting slogans inside their Hercules monument, one saying, uh, <laughs> kind of nice illegal, I would have said stop yeah. deportation. So they realized where the cameras were pointing, what they were looking at, and then put these slogans on, on the walls. And at that point, um, the, the city kind of said, you know, this is a, a public monument. We, we can't really have people people doing this. So we shut it down and I played recordings after that. But that it ran for more than a day. It was kind of amazing to me because <laughs> we had this sort of uh, basically a uh, kind of a climate-controlled uh, box with all, all the equipment. It was like building new songs um, live and then broadcasting. Mm -hmm. For the music, you worked with Scott Harden and John Medeski. John Medeski was totally into um, uh, the, the musical Goblin um, you know, when he heard it. And we were uh, basically had a, a great time just talking about what kind of mo motifs to take, what kind of uh, uh, music to make. And I was there for a few sessions. I play some percussion stuff on, on it as well. But their, their circle of music musicians came in and, and did various things, like uh, Billy Martin came in and did some tracks and uh, singers for vocalizations. And, yeah, and it was... Uh, a great process. We just do some back and forth and to try to figure out how to make these make these songs work. And how was it putting that on CD? Because uh, I guess that's even more complicated than um, Lorna Kinshasa in a way. Yeah. Well, like I say, there's as many as 35 stems in, in some of the songs, where um, basically we have variations of the um, at the same tempo per song, variations mm -hmm. on melody, variations on on, on rhythm, variations on uh, on bass, versions on, on, on sound effects. And they all had to work together um, if you played the different parts together. And mm -hmm. when it was first done, we basically had a fancy sampler. And the, basically, the computer sends a, a, a giant chord to the sampler, and it plays back a, a selection of those stems simultaneously uh, through mm -hmm. the play of music. Now everything's kind of like in a computer, like a one Mac Mini plays everything. But back then, we had to find <laughs> an array of DVDs, uh, plus this, this old school sampler with a hard drive, and then a controller to, to run everything. So it was very uh -huh. kind, of, kind, of, kind of elaborate, but um, yeah, kind of a amazing work. Still kind of magical somehow. And, and for the vinyl version that came out 10 years later, you uh, made a totally different concept that uh, works on the, uh, the chance factor that, uh, with this um, recombination method of the computer correspondence, right? Yeah, the, the record is what you call a roulette record, where you have interlock grooves that um, sort of run in parallel, so it spirals, so it spirals inward. Um, so um, depending on where you drop the needle, when you put uh, part of the record, you hear a different version of the song. So each each side has one song, but then three races of that song. Um, mm. But you're never quite sure which one you're going to hear. The first time I got the record, the test pressing back, I, I played it, and I play each of the different songs in, in, in sequence. Mm -hmm. But I could never actually reproduce that again. After that, it was like totally random, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a, also the sort of uh, somehow spooky thing. In the video installation, The Secret Agent from 2015, you extended the method of recombinant narrative into space. 
Secret Agent is based on uh, a novel by Joseph Conrad called The Secret Agent, which is based on an actual event when uh, there's a bombing at the British Observatory uh, in the late 19th century by this um, person who was kind of associated with uh, uh, sort of anarchist and um, anarchist groups in, in London. I think it was a, a French originally. Um, but I set this in 1975, in the hot summer of 75, a year after the Portuguese Revolution, when you had a lot of extreme left, extreme right-wing groups who were bombing, uh, doing hijackings for very different ends, um, with very, very different uh, uh, ideological points of view. Um, because of the sort of fascist government in, in Portugal, the only um, political organization that was um, sort of organized uh, was the Communist Party, because they were associated with the uh, union groups. And both the extreme left and extreme right didn't want the Communist Party uh, taking power. And so that's, this was a lot of turmoil until the Constitution was, um, uh, was ratified in the, in the fall of uh, 75. Um, but I just took the sort of, the, uh, sort of this comedy about terrorism um, that uh, Conrad wrote um, and transposed it to 1975 and took um, the bombing of the observatory, which kind of marks time, which is kind of crucial to trade in many ways, and replace that with a network because uh, these terrorists want to bomb the Marconi installation at Sembra, which connects telephony uh, between Europe and the New World. So this is kind of a, a key key difference. But many of the characters nicely correspond. Where we have uh, um, uh, originally in Conrad's novel, the uh, secret agent Verloc was Polish living in London and naturalized because he was born there. In my case, the um, Verloc was born in Porto with English parents um, who had a, a winery or something and also naturalized. Um, he had been in Paris um, and in May 68 and sort of got, got in trouble there. And then Ossipon is a, a Maoist pamphleteer. Uh, there's a ex-political prisoner also corresponding with the two stories. And then um, what else is there? There's kind of this uh, charismatic figure who gives entertainment to the, the wealthy, um, Michaelis. Uh, and then the, uh, the various kinds of administration that kind of followed the whole thing. The key thing is Winnie. She kind of left out of the group. Everything else, all these men telling other men how the world is. Uh, but the only one who actually does anything and doesn't just talk about it is Winnie when she finally realizes that Verloc has uh, killed her son and then uh, kills him instead. You understand me perfectly, Mr. Verloc. And as far as I can tell, you have done nothing to earn your salary in the last four years. Now that I am here, you will have to earn your money. No work. No pay. Several times I have prevented... Don't tell me about the old days. The evil is with us now. We don't want prevention. We want a cure. You know there are elections coming up. I do read the papers. Well, Portugal must be brought into line. You will agree with me the middle classes are stupid. They are. They have no imagination. What we need to do is stimulate them with a really good scare. What's the most important thing to the Portuguese people, Mr. Verloc? I would say... You don't know because you're too lazy to think. They don't care about royalty or religion. The fascists drove the aristocrats into hiding and the church is tainted along with the old regime. See what I mean? Perfectly. How about the embassies, a series of bombings directed at... Don't be targets. facetious, Verloc. You can blow up all the embassies in Lisbon without influencing the public one bit. The only thing the Portuguese care about now is the future. They never want to be a backward country again. You anarchists hate the status quo, and since bombs are your means of expression, why not bomb modernity itself? What do you think about an assault on communication? Communication. Blow up the Marconi installation at Sazimbra, Mr. Verloc. Sever! The umbilical between Europe and the It's New a six world. screen video installation, right? Yeah, we have, there's always two, at least two screens going on. Sometimes you have six screens, screens sort of playing simultaneously. Um, but the parents of screens are on either side of the space, and they're in, in these uh, three rows. Um, and they kind of represent different social um, registers. There is um, uh, a private space, uh, the space of uh, Verloc and Winnie's home in the cinema. There's public space, which is inside the cinema and the street. And then there's administration, which is where the uh, Secretary of State lives and the, and the police commissioner and uh, those kinds of people, and, and the ambassador who starts the whole thing. Um, and basically, the, the, we sometimes have characters can navigate all the spaces, and some are stuck in particular kinds of space. Um, but really, it's a condition of being in the middle of, uh, of two things, and you can't see two things at the same time. So the montage has to happen with your body. 
you have to decide what to look at at various points. Uh, in a few cases, there's people talking directly across from each other, and you have to decide which one you want to pay attention to. And so, yeah, it's kind of using uh, the space and the body um, in a way, bringing together um, the recombinant aspect of uh, my work from the 2000s uh, and the spatial aspects of the work from the, the 90s that I was doing in this in this mm -hmm. work. I understand that music plays an important part in uh, connecting the different narratives on the screen. Yeah, basically, there's uh, there's one scene where there's a, a, a sort of a duo playing it in a bar, and the music they play. Uh, there's six iterations of music. The music they played um, three cycles previously become movie music we hear in various other scenes in, in, in the film. There's the uh, conspirators in the projection booth. We hear uh, sort of a tea sound from the small speaker. Uh, we hear music filtering into the, the lobby of the, the, of the, the movie theater, which um, changes the affect of the various scenes taking place there, which is like when uh, Verloc um, or Winnie The wife of her luck understands that uh, uh, she he's responsible for the death of her son, and then she kills him. And then when she's getting betrayed by by Ossipon, these things are um, colored by the affect of the music that we hear uh, in the background. And so it's a very subtle thing, but it's the the quality of um, uh, storytelling changes based on this musical accompaniment in the background. It's kind of the first time I've ever used real movie music in uh, in my movies, even though that's kind of movie music in quotes. We hear. Uh, movie music from the movie theater uh, being used as movie music in my, my movie. <laughs> and uh, tell me, for the music you work together with, uh, you, so you shot and produced in, in Portugal, um, but for the, yeah, also for the music you work together with Portuguese musicians, right? Yeah, a guy named uh, Paulo Furtado, or um, the legendary Tiger Man. And mm -hmm. my, my pitch to him was basically, I want to have, uh, I want to have music that sounds like um, uh, suicide playing um, Clear Spot by um, Captain Beefheart. <laughs> And he kind of took it from there uh, with his climber. <laughs> okay. But it's it's, uh, it's it's very much like... And these, this is all, was also released, right? Um, at least by the legendary yeah, Tiger a, Man. Yeah. Exactly. There's a, there's a record of that as well. And which role does music play in your work in general? I guess the simplest way of saying it is that music, the, the voices in music really are an embodiment of how people can endure time together, um, together or alone. And uh, that model of um, making time-based work has been kind of a fundamental thing I've been mining uh, for most of my career. Uh, what do you listen to or what is your favorite music? I guess my favorite music is probably dub music. Uh, ah, music right. and, uh, music and music um, and disco disco remixes that kind of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, just like you know, any kind of like music that's based on this uh, recombinatory uh, procedure, where it's just taking music and using the studio um, as an instrument. So the whole the whole apparatus is but This is the thing that I really enjoy listening to. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stan, for talking to us, and thank you very much for listening.